Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you all to our first official event. Yay! Uh, for some Woo! <laughs> We're excited to see like, you guys here. Um, I just want to give you guys an idea about what the agenda is going to be like. So we're going to be discussing the topic of whether or not prisoners can be treated humanely when they are behind bars. So we're going to start off with our guest speakers, Warren and Michael Ma, and then we will open the floor for discussion. Um, for this, I really encourage everyone to be really, um, to offer your opinion, even if it's contradictory to someone else's opinion, because that's really what this is all about. It's about unpacking um, and critically thinking about these issues. Um, so let me start off with a quick introduction for our first guest speaker. Uh, Warren has served 22 years in prison um, and has been in the community for about four and a half years now. Uh, he's currently serving a life sentence, uh, but he really has a really interesting perspective um, on this issue. So, in fact, Warren is the person who led me to think that this would be a good idea as a topic of discussion. So, without further ado, Warren. Thank you. So, I was just thinking about this this morning and um, trying to wrap my head around the idea of humane treatment in there. And I have to say, I think that it's impossible to treat prisoners humanely and mostly because I think humane is one of those words that's been kind of stretched and warped as culture evolves to mean something that's you know less cruel instead of something that actually accords a person some dignity like for me um, I have done four sentences I did a four month sentence in juvie one year then I got raised to an adult, I did five years, and then I'm doing a life sentence now. And my first three times in incarceration, well not the first time, the first time was a, wasn't kind of, it was okay. I was in a juvenile camp, um, it was a work camp with pretty strict rules, but there was really good um, uh, life skills there, good bonding, it was a pretty healthy experience. Uh, once I got into actual incarcerated um, situations, I was outraged the first couple times, my first youth sentence, my first federal sentence. Um, I spent probably half of that time in segregation, about 20, 22 months out of a four year, nine month sentence I was in the hole, just because I was absolutely outraged that this is the system that's going to teach me to become a better person and it's so oppressive and violent and degrading and hypocritical that I couldn't stand it and uh, I came out of there the first time worse off than when I went in um, like I was more angry more quickly aggressive um, uh, more hostile in general uh, and especially towards society um, because I I you know, it was a little naive and I thought society was aware of what went on behind closed walls and it wasn't until I read some Foucault and understood that that was the nature and purpose of the institution to blind society from what is actually going on, the power of the state there, that I realized, okay, well, maybe people aren't to blame. They really have no idea what's going on there. Um, this last time I was in there, I was indignant the whole time. So, I mean, I didn't feel that I had room to remain, retain any dignity in there. From the moment you get in there, you're an offender. You become a label, it dehumanizes you. It, you know, antithesis to humane treatment, you become an object right off the bat. Your identity is stripped, not always a bad thing because, you know, we want to kind of retool that and develop an identity that's going to fit into society a little better and not be a threat to anybody's person or their property, um, but still dehumanizing at the same time. Your choice is taken out of it. You don't have power in it. You don't have say in anything that goes on from day to day in your routine. You're told when to get up, what to wear, what time to eat, what to eat, where you can work if you're allowed to work, what kind of treatment you're supposed to take. They say it's voluntary, but try and decline treatment. You end up with your visits impacted by it, you can have your pay cut off, you can be transferred to higher security. 
you could miss out on opportunities to cascade down to lower security or to be released on temporary absence and things like that for refusing voluntary treatment. Um, so it's not really voluntary in any sense of the imagination, not from my experience. And some of the things that would have, you know, allowed me to feel better about myself and to have some dignity um, weren't allowed in there either. For example, uh, having regular contact with my daughter. Like, uh, I, you know, I went in for, I killed a man who assaulted my wife, fractured her skull, um, threatened to go after her again. Um, I thought at the time I was protecting him. My daughter was eight weeks old when I went to jail. <clears throat> she was 15 when I got out. Um, so I missed out on a lot. First word, first steps, first day of school, all the Halloweens, the Christmases, all the fun stuff. I couldn't be there in any meaningful way. I couldn't even be there for her to talk to when she wanted to talk to her dad. Can't phone into an institution. And, uh, you know, many times, there were many times, she was actually turned away from the institution um, under some kind of obfuscating policy that was really a poorly disguised attempt to punish me for my political activities on the inside. Um, and I took it upon myself at one point, I cut off all of my visits, all my contact with the outside, because I just thought, okay, well, if we're going to really sort this stuff out, this is really important to me. This is the rest of my life. I'm doing a life sentence. In Canada, that means I don't ever have to get out. I can be in here for the rest of my life. I have to do the work and make the changes to be able to persuade the parole board that I know where I went wrong and that I've made some changes and I have the tools and support and skills needed to make sure I don't ever do that again. Um, but at the same time, I have to retain a sense of self and a sense of autonomy. Um, and so I thought, well, this is the rest of my life. It might be important to some of the staff there, but it's a career for them. Maximum, you know, 20 years, 25 years. I thought, well, I can outlast you guys and I'm going to make it so it's just me and you. You can't mess with my family, you can't mess with my friends, and we're going to deal with this stuff. So I got really deep into political and legal activism on the inside. Um, there were a lot of things that really bothered me that I thought could really contribute to rehabilitation and reintegration. And also, not just for me, but for my daughter. Like my daughter, like I say, it was my responsibility. Um, if there's anybody to blame, I don't believe in blame because it's only a channel towards punishment, which really isn't very productive. I mean, you're not looking for solutions when you're looking to punish, right? So we're just looking to hurt somebody because we're hurt. So um, I would have liked to have been able to support her while I was in there. I would have liked to have been able to have more regular contact with her when I was in there. And the problem is, the way the system set up for security purposes, um, I really had difficulty staying in contact with her. My spouse at the time, who's now my ex, fell into addiction when my appeal failed. So my daughter ended up in ministry custody and then ministry guardianship and tried to battle the ministry um, in court and show that you're a fit parent when you don't know if you're ever getting out of prison. <laughs> you know, to try and maintain contact to try and maintain access and have a relationship so that she doesn't become a statistic. I'm not sure um, what type of material you've studied before coming here, but um, you know, the statistics for girls who have poor or distance or non-existent relationships with their dads is um, very frightening. It was terrifying for me. Um, so I would have liked to have had more contact her, with her. Once she was in foster care, I had no way to reach her. I couldn't phone the foster home collect because other kids there don't have any contact with their parents. It could be disturbing to their growth and their journey to have, you know, Amber's mom phone or dad phone and stuff. So, and even when I could phone, if she was, you know, at respite or something for the weekend, any place I phoned from there, even across the street from the institution, was a flat rate, 27 cents a minute collect. And so, I mean, we make five bucks a day. We weren't allowed to pay for our own calls. You're not allowed to get a real job or earn a real income in there. So how do you support your kid? They end up on the social net. Everybody else is paying for them. And um, 
you know, it deprives them of an opportunity to grow and have meaningful relationships and community around them, and deprives me of an ability to build esteem and responsibility as a father. And it puts weight on the taxpayers that I don't think needs to happen. Um, so that's one issue. There's, and it's funny, like visits are known and have been known for a long time through research to be, well, the single most effective contributor to successful rehabilitation or reintegration. If you don't have contact with the outside, your chances when you get out are pretty slim, which is what makes it toughest for guys doing life sentences. Um, the longer you're in, like, I mean, your friends kind of drift away right away. Family kind of hangs in there for a while, and by the time you get to about a decade in, the only person left is mom, right? And um, because it's just, it's painful to think about going in there. It's more painful to actually try and go in there. I don't know if any of you have done tours as part of your classes, uh, but the drug strategy they have in there and the screening tools that they have, totally unreliable, but um, enforced to the 10th degree. And it alienates people. It leads to feelings of resentment. Um, and, you know, it's like Pavlov's conditioning. I mean, it gets to the point where as soon as your family thinks they're coming to see you, they think about all the pain they go through at the front gate, and it becomes painful to actually think about seeing you, and they just don't come anymore. My, my dad actually put it to me that way. He goes, you know what? He goes, it's just too hard. It hurts too much to come in there and go into that visits room with all the barbed wire and the microphones and the tables and the cameras everywhere and the guards wandering back and forth, and to think that that's the most comfortable and relaxed environment in that institution. And so when we leave, you're going through the razor wire into the rest of the institution, and who knows what you're doing for the rest of the time. They just couldn't stand it after a while. So I didn't see my family sometimes for a couple of years, you know, not counting the time where I cut all my visits off for the political stuff. But um, so for me, like I believe to have dignity and to be human, I mean, there are things that we have as core needs. As much as we need water and shelter and nutrition, we need to have a sense of autonomy. We need self-determination. We need to have um, a sense of inclusion, a sense of uh, contribution and acceptance and belonging. Um, all of these things are taken away while we're in there. Um, if you try to set up a group or a club and do something where you're belonging, the risk of being labeled as a gangster or an organizer or things like that are pretty high. They have some cultural groups that are allowed in there, um, but really it's about they have a dinner a couple times a year and they get a special visiting event usually once a year. And I think that's even changed since I've been there. So I mean they weren't really allowed a lot of cultural activities or events per se. I mean it's you know it was uh, they say they kind of try to accommodate it, but not really. I don't know how many times I saw elders searched and refused entry because the ion scanner went off on them. And I mean, these are people that are traveling the whole continent and spiritual leaders in their communities, nothing to do with drugs or anything, but because this little machine beeps, that's it. They're labeled a, a trafficker and they get sent away with no chance to vindicate themselves. That ion scanner was the biggest pain in our butt for as long as I can remember, ever since it was brought in. It's not, you know, flawed technology exactly. It's just not designed for use in that environment. It's meant to be used in a laboratory where it controlled humidity, controlled temperature, you know, where it's kind of clean, you can control the contaminants to get in and out of there. Not at a gatehouse in an institution or in an airport. You know, a lot of airports used to use them also. But they're designed to test and identify particles in the, um, where are the nanograms, thousandth of a gram. And it was actually found that substances over that amount would contaminate the machine and block its reading and it would have to actually ionize and burn that material down before it would start reading again. So say for example, me and Mike and you two go into an institution, I could do a line out in the parking lot wipe my hands in the bag of cocaine and go in and I'd be clean. And Mike would go in clean and you'd come in clean and you'd bring up hot for cocaine and you'd be surrounded by guards and taken to another room and asked where's the drugs, what's going on, who are you smuggling for, who's pressuring you, who's the leader, 
blah, blah, blah. If you don't have the answers, out you go, and you don't come back. And so many people went through that over the years. It was just horrendous watching it. Um, but try to get rid of it. I mean, when a minister spends $4 million on new technology and says it's, you know, going to be their leading effort in the war on drugs, how do you get them to go out in the public and change their mind, right? Not happening. So um, we have to live with it. But, um, yeah, so as far as um, having those needs met, there's just really, there wasn't a way to do it in there. We tried, like we, with the lifers group, we set up a, we end up setting up a lifers kitchen. And here's an example of how long things take in there. So we come up with this idea. Because lifers sit still for so long, um, the average person in prison there is there for about uh, 27, 28 months. So, but, and so the population, about 70% of it turns over pretty frequently, relatively. And then you have lifers that sit there and they'll be in the same cell in the same wing for 10, 12, 15, 16 years. And they watch all these people come and go. Makes it difficult to form relationships. I mean, you don't want to become friends with somebody who can't get it together and keeps coming back to see you, right? I mean, you know that's not going to be a relationship you want to keep on the outside because you're never going to see them out there, right? Um, and so they tend to isolate and withdraw and get very depressed. And the longer they're in, like I mentioned before, your community support kind of falls away, it erodes. Next thing you know, you're alone. And you haven't been out so long that, excuse me, you can't even visualize what it's like anymore. So imagine looking out your kitchen window, say, in your backyard, really foggy out there, you can't see past the deck. So you know you've got a shed out there, you've got a lawnmower, you've got bikes out there, you know where the limits are, the borders of your yard, you know where you're safe, that's your property, that's where you can go and feel. You know it's there, you know it's there, but you can't see it. Try to visualize it. You have to go out there and wander around to find out where your bike is or where the lawnmower is, right? It's kind of like that, but on a much more deeper level because the whole world's like that. It's all evolved while you've been in there. I mean, there's guys in there that haven't seen or used an ATM, never mind MP3 players and iPods, and, or I mean, you know, tablets and stuff like that. They have no idea. And it's terrifying for them. Like in there, right, all your decisions are taken away. So imagine trying to figure out, after all those years, no decisions, no responsibility, Trying to figure out, well, when I get out, where am I going to live? How am I going to pay rent? How am I going to do my bills? How am I going to build credit? How am I going to get a job? How am I going to explain 15 years with a big gap? No education, no employment, no training, nothing to show in there to show an employer that, hey, you know what, I can do something for you. I've got something valuable for you. Pretty difficult. Um, me, I'm kind of a bit of an anomaly that way. All the stuff that I did, um, all the representation of groups and organizing of their social events and things like that all help me develop transferable skills that I can market out here. I mean, I'm a, I'm a programs coordinator for a counseling agency in Burnaby. We run intensive um, day treatment for adult addicts throughout the Fraser Valley. Um, so, I mean, I was able to do that, but a lot of guys can't. A lot of guys, like when I got out, I um, I went to work driving a five-ton truck delivering construction supplies around the Lower Mainland. I thought it would be good, get me back into the routine, help me learn the Lower Mainland. Another guy, close friend of mine, been in the same amount of time as me, took him over a month to leave the block he was living on. So institutionalized, so accustomed to such a small world, so terrified of the big world out here, no idea where to go, no family, no friends, no connections. What do you do, right? And, I mean, you all are well aware, how do you connect with people these days? People don't talk face-to-face -face much anymore. That's all we know how to do in there, because technology is basically prohibited. Um, you know, we have some computer access there, but they're basically typewriters with screens, because, um, well, when I left, they were just upgrading to Windows XP five years ago. And um, you weren't allowed to save anything on the hard drive. You had to use floppy disks. Remember three and a half inch floppy disks? Mm -hmm. That's our memory media in there. Um, and you're allowed five of those. So if I'm in there 15 years, all my data has got to fit on three or five three and a half inch floppy disks. Not very easy to do. 
So <clears throat> it's, um, yeah, I think that there's a lot of challenges in there. I think it's nice that they say that we treat prisoners more humanely, but really they just mean less cruelly. It's not really humane. Um, you're not allowed to really be human in there. And I don't think it's really something that's deliberate, like that they intend to go in there and say we're going to strip your humanity. I think, from my limited reading, that it's a psychic dissonance that kind of creates a conflict for them, that when you're locking that cage every day, how do you believe that that person is deserving of love and compassion and empathy? You know, the hallmarks of humanity, right, of humane treatment, compassion and empathy. How can you have compassion for somebody? Say you want to ease their suffering and help them their, ease their suffering when you're locking that cage several times a day. You've got razor wire surrounding them so they can't go anywhere. When you're not allowed to have regular phone access, like a cell phone, even in minimum security, where there's no fence. You know, I could walk downtown, uh, and, and indeed guys did from there. They go downtown to the beer store and come back with booze and party it up in their units. And yet, I'm not allowed to have a cell phone there. I mean, from my perspective, understanding security a little bit, it'd be so easy to manage. I can hand my cell phone bill into Ipso every month. I can have, you know, pre-approved numbers that I'm allowed to call. If they see anything out of the ordinary, they confiscate the phone or they ship me to higher security or something. Very easy to manage. And if you run it through a software program and have it all electronic, I mean, it could be done so much easier. Same as searching mail. They refuse to let us have email in there. In the States, they do. It's easier to search, easier to control. You have more contact with the outside. I mean, searching a person's physical mail requires a staff member or more to sit there, read through them, read through it page by page to look for you know suspicious or incriminating information. Whereas, if somebody's using email and you think they're up to something, you type in your couple of keywords, search, and boom, there's six years mail searched in like five minutes. You know what I mean? So much easier, so much more convenient, so actually more secure, and also respecting more of their rights to privacy because we are still supposed to retain some rights to privacy in there, but we don't. I still have a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission right now because me, I'm status native, I'm not allowed on a reserve unless I waive my rights to privacy and let my parole officer go and talk to the chief and council and give them their opinion about who they think I am and what I'm about and see if they approve of me being there. And this came into effect about two years after I was out. I was already enrolled in a diploma program. I got a grant, went into a two-year diploma program for IT and uh, I was working on a couple reserves um, just been promoted to supervisor, um, constructing some uh, homes and a rec center and stuff like that on a couple of different native communities. And all of a sudden they said, okay, well, we need you to sign this waiver because we need to go to talk to these communities and make sure they approve of you being here. I said, they do approve of me being here. They gave me a grant to do this education and they pay me to come and build stuff. So obviously they approve of me being here. Like, well, they don't know everything about your past. I'm like, well, who cares? I don't know everything about their past. Why do they have a right to know about mine? They said, well, you know, First Nations communities are different. It's like going into another country. I said, well, not for me, I'm status. That's my home. That's where I come from. That's where my culture is. Like, I don't have access to spirituality now because the only place to get to a long house is on a reserve. And I'm not allowed on there. I could become a Jehovah's Witness or a Jew or a Muslim and go to any of those churches anywhere in the Lower Mainland and I don't have to have CSC over there sharing all my dirt. I can go to work in Mission today, I can go to work in Richmond tomorrow, be in Hope the next day. They don't have to go up and talk to City Hall or the council there and tell them all my dirt only when I go to a Native community. I don't get it. I don't understand it. And especially when that is my community, right? Like, how do you explain that? That's why I say, like, even on the outside still, there's, you know, cause for indignation, right? So, um, I don't really see it as being totally humane. Um, kinder sometimes, you know, and sometimes even that's a stretch. But not, not humane, not compassionate, not empathic. Um, in fact, I had a unit manager whose responsibility was the visiting area. When I was in there talking to her one day about policy, it was my job as a committee representative. 
And she said, you know what, I am proud to say in 20 years working with corrections, I have never let compassion affect one of my visiting decisions. And she used to it's like, you know, you've never let your compassion for their humanity and their relationships ever factor into any of your decisions. Like, what do you base these decisions on? Like, seriously, it doesn't make sense to me totally. I, I can't get it. And, um, but she was happy and proud of herself. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, it's a totally alien and surreal environment. I don't think they have a choice. I mean, it starts from the moment that you put the uniform on. The uniform is a psychological barrier right there. It creates an us and them. We are us and you are something else. And, um, you know, it's tough to bridge that gap. And especially in there where there's so much worry and even paranoia about security. Um, you know, people, people are kind of funny creatures. When we end up in conflict with others, happens all the time in life, and we find something frustrating or painful or inconvenient, if we don't know what's going on and we fill in the gaps, what do we do? Always the worst case scenario. They intended to fuck with me, they wanted to hurt my feelings, they wanted to screw up my stuff, um, just because that's the way it turned out. We assume they intended it, but you know what? 99% of the time they have no idea they even impacted you. Everybody's chasing their own little carrots, wandering around this world in pursuit of whatever makes them happy, helps them feel free, helps them feel part of whatever they're doing. And oftentimes we don't even realize we're stepping on each other's toes. I have found, and it took me a long time to learn it, you just kind of ask people what's going on, or let them know that something's been a frustration or a hindrance to you. And more often than not, Empathy leads to compassion, leads to a desire to build a solution together, and they would rather support you than continue to frustrate you most of the time. Um, not always, but uh, many of people are generally kind. But in there, it makes it difficult. Just the environment itself makes it difficult to be that way. And I don't think uh, it's going to change anytime soon. I mean, you know, well, and we have Trudeau in there now and uh, trying to make a mark that's distinct from his dad's. And, uh, you know, when the charter came in, I studied that stuff. We did a seminar and then we started a pilot program. It was one of a kind in the country. We studied the evolution of uh, corrections law and philosophy and policy um, and uh, all the jurisprudence and stuff. So, and we actually had advocates who were paid to represent other prisoners' interests, dealing with staff management when it came to decisions that impacted employment or visits or transfers or absences or um, programming or pretty well anywhere discipline where you face a tribunal, liberty hearings. Um, and it was kind of interesting. It was like a five-month seminar and Michael Jackson, the professor who was kind of leading it, um, said it was as intense or more so as some of his third year uh, classes that he teaches. And we invited some of the staff to come in and be part of that so that we could all be on common ground, all have the same information, the same understanding, and be able to work together to find dynamic and innovative solutions that were going to try and help the system evolve a little bit. But the staff refused to come. <coughs> didn't want to be parties to it. Um, and so they had a lot of fear, a lot of distrust. And when the project started, there was a lot of conflict. And the staff actually, uh, they went on a, a kind of a, a type of strike. They decided to stop issuing disciplinary offenses because they said that, well, it doesn't matter what we do. We issue these offenses. They go see the advocates, and the charges get thrown out, and blah, blah, blah. But really, it was about teaching them to have respect for the process and to have due diligence and to go through the channels and the steps um, so that they could be role models for us to teach us to do the same thing. And um, eventually they kind of understood that and it became more amicable. Um, but uh, it was interesting going through that seminar and watching how it unfolded. We worked for about three years and then I transferred and I uh, ended up going back because I was a dumbass in minimum the first time and uh, got caught out of bounds hiking up in the woods and stuff, just getting back to nature. 
And you know, that was my own fault, my own attitude. It was, I was in a native healing camp and Mother Nature was all out of bounds. They didn't have any medicine walks, no nothing, no way to go and have access to it. A fundamental, the foundation of native spirituality and it was out of bounds. Um, so there were guys up there that went on hikes on their own and swimming and stuff in the creeks and that. And I took part in that and I got caught and sent back. And the advocacy program had already been dismantled by then in a short six months. So we got it up and running again. Um, ran it for about two years, year and a half, I got transferred out of there again. And um, I don't think it's right now, which is sad. I mean, it's really it, all it was. It wasn't about winning or anybody getting better or, than each other or anything. It was about promoting the rule of law and respect for human rights. That was the policy mandate of the project. And um, there was just so much hostility towards it. People seem to think that human rights make somebody special over somebody else. Well, all the human rights are all, they make things better for the prisoners or the criminals. And, you know, what about the victims? And what about these people? Human rights are the same rights for everybody. Everybody is the same. There's no victims' rights. There's no women's rights or, you know, minority rights. Human rights are human rights. Everybody's a human being. Everybody deserves equal treatment and respect under the law. And unfortunately, the human rights legislation only applies to government agencies, so a lot of people tend to think that it's not really effective because they don't see the same standards in the private sector. Um, and, you know, I mean, the biggest complaint from the victims is mostly just that they're not involved in the process. And that's just the way our system is set up. Your crime isn't against the victim, it's against the queen. And, I mean, you know, I don't want to sound slanderous, but who the hell is the queen like? She's not here. This is the person that's hurt right now, right? This is the person that needs help and restoration and to be healed and included in a process that's going to be meaningful for them, where they get to a point where, um, you know, they can feel better again and feel safe. But there's no room for that in there. And that takes away from our humanity, too. And that makes it inhumane, because the people that most need the help aren't part of the process. Even though it's legislated. I mean, it's right at the founding or the guiding principles of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act that they shall include members of the public when they're making their policy and developing their operations, but they don't. They have citizens' advisory committees. I don't mean any disrespect to them either, but they tend to kind of, well, the administration sets up the meetings and keep their meetings separate from the meetings with the representatives, and it's basically a lot of politics. A lot of fluff talk about how good things are, and in reality, they don't get to see what's going on. And they don't have as much voice, I don't think, as the legislators intended when they put the act into place. The Corrections and Conditional Release Act, I think, is um, a marvelous piece of legislation and could have done wonders for our country. The problem is it's never really been fully respected or implemented. It's been resisted by the culture inside there since its inception. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of resistance. Institutions take a long time to evolve. And especially in there, um, it just, it doesn't happen very easily at all. Not at all. Yeah, a lot of sadness I had when we were, you know, we saw how all that was developed from the Charter through all the jurisprudence to the coming of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act. So much hope and inspiration and a lot of good thinking went into all that stuff, but, um, it hits the ground and people either don't understand it or they think that it'll cause too many problems. You know, the old fear, you open the floodgate, remember the Eskimo with the Lay's chip out on the ice flow, right? That kind of thinking. Well, I gave you one, everybody else has to have one. And nobody else wants one. You know what I mean? Everybody needs a different solution. It's like I teach people in the programs I do now, right? There's not one path that fixes everybody. Addiction is a multifaceted process and everybody gets there their own way, and there's many different ways out of it. Not the same thing's gonna work. You gotta keep trying things out and find what works for you and use that. And let the rest of it go. But there's no room for that in, in there either. Because it's an institution, because they need to maintain security, it's cookie cutter process. From intake and induction and orientation to the time you get out of there. Cookie cutter. All process and timelines based on your release dates and eligibilities. Program interventions are based, again, on release dates, timelines. 
not on motivation, not on readiness for treatment. That's one of the biggest complaints I had as a peer counselor and advocate in there. Guys complaining they couldn't get into programs when they want because they're not at the right place in their sentence. And guys complaining that, you know what, they got pulled out of getting their welding ticket or pulled out of their schooling to do this program that they're not ready for. And so they're sitting there in a program, hostile and resistant and not gaining anything. And the person that really wants and needs the program and is motivated and would gain from it can't get in. It's just totally absurd to me. Um, but, again, a lot of it's about power and control, too. Am I out of time? Unfortunately. Okay, that's good. I was wondering a couple of times, look how close am I? <laughs> All right, I yeah. will uh, shut it down. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Laura. Thank you so much, Warren. I think you offer such an interesting perspective on this issue. Um, so now let's hear.